then post it to Facebook uh, for the people that could not make it later. So uh, Darren, take it away. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Jesse, and uh, thank you all for coming out and uh, sitting here with me this evening to, to hear about all the projects that are going on at the city. I will say before I start, I'm only uh, intimately involved in a couple of these projects, so I, uh, I won't necessarily have all the details that you might want. Um, but any questions that are asked at the end, uh, or as we go along, feel free to, to plug the questions into the chat function and Jesse will, uh, uh, will uh, go through those at the end with me. And, and any that I can't answer, I will try to get answers for. And uh, we'll send that out to uh, the email list or, or however uh, Jesse wishes to communicate that out. Uh, so I'll just, uh, I'll double track. You can all see my screen. Is that correct, Jesse? Just give me a thumbs up there. Perfect. Okay. So uh, I'll, I'll start here. Uh, if I can get it to go there. Uh, the first project that you're all probably aware of, because this is mostly uh, finished, I think, at this point, was the Alexander and Sio uh, Mill and Resurface. Uh, they did add some bike lanes in there from Alexander, on Alexander from Clinton to, uh, to Bixby. Uh, I know they they looked at adding in some other locations, but usually they tend not to put uh, bike lanes down on purely residential streets, uh, which is what it would be between Mount Hope and, and South Avenue. So uh, they, they neglected to do those there. Uh, this is another project that's currently in the planning phases and it's uh, packaged as, as three separate uh, areas there, but uh, we are going to be putting full bike lanes down on Beach Avenue from the city line all the way up to Wilder Terrace. Uh, and then Dewey Avenue is also going to be getting bike lanes from uh, Winchester to, to Eastland. Um, the Lake Avenue portion that they'll be doing uh, with this project, what goes from uh, Beach Avenue up to the Lake Ontario State Parkway, will not uh, include bike lanes. Uh, so the Brewery Line Trail is a project that's in the early planning phases, and uh, you can read the, the side of the slide there, uh, and we will send these slides out uh, later on as well, so you'll be able to look at the pictures more closely and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but this, this project's still in the early planning phases, and, and the, uh, the bits you see there are, are mostly the, the intended outcomes of the project. Uh, it'll still require a full design and, of course, funding. Uh, so some of those might change, but they do intend to uh, repair and improve the trail from the uh, Ponteren Bridge uh, down to uh, St. Paul Boulevard. Um, they've got, you know, a number of pedestrian amenities that they're hoping to add, a rain garden feature, uh, permanent steel canopy over top of the uh, a new or a rebuilt, uh, well, the existing overlook, but it'll be, I think, reinforced and rebuilt a bit. Uh, and then they're also going to replace the electrical system in there to, uh, to give it uh, better light. Uh, Broadway is an upcoming project that will be put out, I believe, for design bid uh, this, this year. So we'll be looking for a consultant later this year, and they'll be doing the design next year. So you can expect to see public meetings for this that you can get involved in. But the intent of this is to create a two-way street from Monroe Avenue down to Miggs. Uh, and then it'll be a one-way street uh, as it currently is between Goodman and Mix. Um, but this two-way, we are hoping to uh, add either bike lanes uh, on the entire two-way portion or possibly uh, protected cycle tracks. Uh, and a lot of that will come down to the consultation portion. So, you know, I, I would encourage people to uh, keep their ear to the ground for when this, this comes out and, and really get out there and... Uh, uh, represent uh, what you what you think the cyclist needs are in the uh, uh, in this area. Carter and North Street is another uh, mill and resurface that's uh, that's ongoing. Uh, there there isn't going to be any additional bike lanes, but they are doing uh, spot improvements to sidewalks on on the lengths of those that you can see on the map there. Um, and they'll be doing some upgraded crosswalk markings uh, throughout where there's uh, existing crosswalk markings. Uh, so you can expect to see that as well. Uh, Cottage of Magnolia is a project that I believe will be going to build uh, this, uh, it's either this year or possibly next year. 
and there'll be a uh, narrowing Magnolia Street there between uh, Seward and uh, Plymouth where it's uh, very wide and then uh, Seward itself will get uh, a tabled crosswalk uh, right in front of the school. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor there, but right about where my cursor is is, is where you can expect to see a, uh, a tabled crosswalk. Uh, the rest of the, uh, the project will just be uh, resurfacing the streets for the most part. Uh, they're currently uh, redoing this uh, uh, structural support of the bridge and the, uh, uh, the, the surface as well. And they're, they're not adding or subtracting anything there. So you can expect to see the, the bike lanes uh, maintained. They will be, of course, resurfacing. So it should be slightly nicer bike lanes. And they're rebuilding those sidewalks. So those will also be in uh, better shape. Uh, so the East Main Street, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard uh, quite a bit about and probably been involved in as well. Uh, you can see this is the, the current proposal uh, that I pulled out of a PowerPoint uh, that I believe they either just presented or are going to present uh, that shows the, the roadways, two configurations that it'll be throughout the uh, corridor from Goodman to Culver. Uh, so you can see they are going to maintain a five foot wide cycle track on either side uh, one way. Uh, with a one and a half foot buffer between that and a five and a half foot side uh, wide sidewalk. Uh, so you will get functionally uh, 12 feet of space on either side of the road for, for walking and biking, um, which, uh, you know, we, we did push for uh, uh, slightly more space, I know, but uh, unfortunately a lot of the local businesses and residents uh, uh, insisted on parking in the corridor, so that was, uh, that was necessary to maintain uh, some of that where we could have possibly widened the tree lawns and, and given cyclists and pedestrians a bit more space. Um, the Eastman Trail, uh, phase one, uh, was, uh, as I was, I was cautioned there, it's in design, but it's also very much pending the acquisition of this property from, I believe, uh, Kodak. Uh, and that's, that's been a bit of a process uh, right now. So there, there isn't any guarantee that we'll actually end up getting uh, the property. Uh, but should we uh, get the property, uh, would uh, establish an off-road trail along that former uh, canal corridor there. Uh, and you can see the black lines are where it would be off-road and then along the roads itself, it would be uh, either bike lanes or some sort of protected bike lane, uh, depending on, on space. I don't, I don't think they've done any sort of detailed design at this point on, on this uh, project. Uh, the Elmwood College Town cycle track, I hope uh, you've all been down there to enjoy that. It's, uh, it's mostly complete at this point. I, I did see they'd painted all the lines, and, and, uh, or most of the lines, uh, last weekend, I believe, or the weekend before. Uh, all the lights are in now, so this, this is a mostly complete project. Uh, this is another uh, project, uh, mostly an MNR that's that's going on uh, design this year, and it's uh, it's going to take Emerson J and Driving Park. You can see the limits sort of on the map there. It's uh, somewhat hard to see, but it's uh, J Street at the top, or Emerson at the top, uh, J and, uh, and uh, oh my God, I've got that backwards. Driving Park at the top, and J and the uh, Emerson in the middle, and and J at the bottom there. Sorry about that. I should have organize that a little better. Um, but uh, for driving park, it's from the uh, CSX tracks there all the way down to Dewey Avenue. Uh, for Emerson, it's from Mount Reed uh, almost down to Dewey. Uh, and then on uh, J Street, it's from Mount Reed down to the CSX tracks. Uh, so there's a couple improvements that'll be coming along with these. We've got a couple curb bump outs to reduce crossing distances. Uh, one at driving park at Lark Street, uh, right near the school there. And then uh, Emerson at uh, Norman Street, or sorry, that's near the school there. Um, we've, uh, we'll also be improving the bus stops uh, throughout those uh, three corridors with some landing pads where they don't currently exist. And then uh, bike lanes we will be putting on uh, most of Emerson Street. So from Mount Reed to Curlew, we'll, uh, we uh, will be putting uh, bike lanes down. And then from Curlew to uh, Dewey, there will be the consideration which will be based on uh, consultation in that area and due to fairly heavy use of the parking, on-street parking in that area, it's, it's likely that, uh, that we probably won't put bike lanes there, but that the diversion off of uh, Curlew onto, is it, 
Curtis Street, I think, uh, the one just south of Emerson there will, will be the, uh, the diversion that'll be a, a cycle route. Uh, and then J Street, they are at this point intending to put bike lanes down for the, the length of that project. Uh, so that'll uh, mostly connect bike lanes uh, for J Street from uh, Mount Reed all the way through to uh, Plymouth. Uh, so Erie Harbor phase two is a, a park project that uh, they're anticipating to award this year and construct next year. Uh, they do have a master plan in place for the the entire park but the uh, the two uh, areas on that map at the bottom that are circled with the red dots uh, those are the areas that the funding will cover for for the build out next year uh, they will be doing some um, uh, some minor improvements to the actual genesee river trail there uh, along with railing repair and repainting throughout um, but those two park areas, uh, because I, th I think the funding comes from a, a source for um, environmental remediation and whatnot, and both those sites were, were previous uh, environmental hazard areas, I think uh, part of the money will help clean up those areas and then uh, re-implement uh, the improvements. And you will see a, uh, a boat ramp at the, uh, the northern part there for, for hand carry boats, canoes, kayaks, that sort of thing. Uh, the High Falls Overlook is, uh, they're currently doing a feasibility study to see if that structure can hold an overlook. Uh, and if it can, uh, then there will be a uh, possible design in the future as part of the Rock the Riverway project. Um, connections will be made to that brewery line trail uh, that, uh, that we talked about earlier, uh, if, if this is a feasible project. So Hudson and Avenue and St. Paul Streets uh, are also uh, planned to get repaved here. Uh, and there will be bike lanes put down for most of the length of Hudson Avenue. Um, there will be a couple little areas where there's sheriffs only that are shown in yellow on the map there. And then St. Paul Street from Central Avenue to Gorham Street will also get uh, bike lanes. So the Interloop North study is, uh, is a fairly major undertaking that I think a number of you on this call have been involved in, uh, either peripherally or through the, the Community Advisory Committee. Uh, but this is a full reimagining of the, of the uh, Interloop North corridor. Um, and there is uh, at the website there, interloopnorth.com. I would encourage you to put that in your, in your browsers and, and check back uh, constantly. They're, they're doing updates every, every week or two uh, with uh, newsy items or or asking for feedback or things like that uh you know due to the uh, the covid health emergency we've been unable to do a number of our our planned uh public engagement activities out and about in the community uh so we are looking at that and and as these phased reopenings come we should hopefully be able to uh once again uh you know do some pop-up events at the, the public market and, and other places in the neighborhood to, to solicit feedback from residents and and uh, people who travel on the corridor uh, so the Lara Marquetta project, uh, you probably noticed some stuff going on on that property. Uh, not really going to touch on that here, but one of the things that uh, has been uh, battered around is doing a streetscape project adjacent to the, the, the La Marquetta there on uh, uh, North Clinton Avenue. Uh, and we, we haven't started the design or, or dedicated funding to it yet, but there is uh, some significant interest at the city to, to do some traffic calming elements like Reconnect did this past year with, uh, um, you know, curb bump outs and ramps and additional crosswalks and, and we'll look at, uh, you know, painted parking lanes and some other things uh, uh, designed to slow traffic down through this area. So that, that'll be a project that'll, that'll probably uh, uh, slowly ramp up over the next year or two. Uh, Lake Avenue from uh, Burley to the Lake Ontario State Parkway is being completely uh, milled and resurfaced. Uh, unfortunately, in this area, they they didn't want to uh, move down from four lanes to, to three, so there wasn't going to be additional room for cycle lanes uh, in this section. So, uh, there, uh, there is going to be a number of crossings that will be upgraded to uh, higher visibility uh, paint and additional curb cuts put in. I think they're also removing some underutilized uh, curb cuts um, in the corridor. Uh, Linden and Oakland Street, uh, if you've been over in that area, you can see that's, that's currently uh, being constructed right now. 
there's uh, really just as far as uh, honorable users are concerned, just some improvements to the sidewalks and the ADA ramps uh, throughout there from Caroline to Rockingham and uh, Mount Vernon to South Avenue there. Uh, Lyle Avenue was uh, is, uh, currently ongoing, but it's uh, uh, well underway there and they've, uh, they've planning. Uh, so every bike lane that existed there is remaining and then they're also extending bike lanes in some locations to, to try to complete the entire corridor. I believe there's a couple areas where it wasn't feasible due to parking and bus stops and, and things like that. Excuse me, but uh, it was it was mostly accomplished. Uh, there was some upgrading of a few of the bus stops in the area to provide more room. I believe a, a possibly a shelter or two was was intended. I, I'm not sure if they actually did that or not. Uh, and then they they upgraded curb ramps throughout the project. Take some water. So McGee and Rains is a uh, another project that uh, they're realigning the pavement area to reduce vehicle speeds through this area. So they're they're tightening the curves at uh, either end of Rains there, and they're they're hoping these new alignments will will increase compliance with the stop controls and and perhaps slow traffic down a little bit through there. We do know uh, a number of these streets are are um, do attract uh, uh, people who like the speed a bit. Um, so this, this should hopefully uh, help uh, reduce speeds in this area. So the uh, Main Street uh, Streetscape project is, is currently going on uh, and that is, uh, or the, the design is mostly finished at this point and they'll, they'll bid it this fall and, and hopefully construct next year. Um, and as you, you'll see on this slide and the next slide, uh, they, they do down next to State Street here, um, from about the bridge to State Street, they have the bus lanes that are a shared bus bike lane. You can sort of see the sharrows in the red there. Um, they'll be also uh, improving all the sidewalks, curb ramps, uh, doing uh, various streetscape enhancements, and then of course repaving the road as well. Uh, they're also replacing those bus shelters in the uh, westbound direction there at State, uh, uh, State and uh, Maine. So this is the, uh, the rest of that corridor that they're repairing up to uh, South Avenue there. And you can see they're adding in bike lanes uh, from South basically to uh, the other end of the bridge where the, um, where the uh, uh, bus lane starts. So Monroe and South are mostly finalized at this point. Uh, as you probably noticed, they, they did a significant upgrade to the, uh, the bike lanes in, on Monroe. Uh, they've added quite a few there. Uh, they've eliminated a few unnecessary churn lanes. Uh, they've, you know, improved uh, um, a number of mid-block crosswalks as well at uh, Monroe and Boardman. Uh, the little LS after there just means they did the ladder style. Uh, that's not actually what it's. L is uh, ladder and S is, I think, uh, the bars or whatever. But when you put them together, it's it's the ones that have the bars and the, and the, the sides. So. Um, they've done that with all of them, and those are uh, sort of the higher visibility crosswalks at those, those four locations, so Monroe and Boardman, South and Caroline, South at Hamilton, and South at Comfort. Uh, this project, uh, I believe, is uh, currently underway. Um, they'll be uh, resurfacing this entire road. Uh, and due to space constraints there, uh, they, they couldn't fit any bicycle facilities in, uh, but they will be upgrading uh, uh, curb ramps and, and uh, sidewalks throughout uh, as needed. So the pedestrian safety action plan is a fairly significant uh, chunk of federal money that we got uh, to upgrade uh, various signalized and unsignalized uh, uh, pedestrian crossings in the city. Uh, so at this point, and, and once we get into a more detailed design, we might find out we don't have the resources to do all these locations. Uh, but we're hoping to do about 117 signalized locations and 154 unsignalized locations. And so at those signalized locations, we'll be looking to, uh, to paint the L or the LS crosswalks. So the LS, once again, is the ones that look like ladders, and the Ls are just the, the bars that go from one side of the street to the other, so parallel bars. Uh, we'll get reflective backplates, which uh, go behind the lights uh, to basically make the lights more visible uh, to, to drivers. Uh, 55 of those crossings will be getting uh, leading pedestrian intervals. 
uh, which just means that when you press the signal button or if it's, uh, if it's one of the ones downtown that just goes automatically, then uh, you'll get a signal to cross uh, five, 10 seconds before any lights turn green. So it, uh, those have been shown to greatly improve the safety of pedestrians crossing the road. I believe there's also about seven locations that will get the accessible pedestrian signal that just uh, that chirps and uh, it's a little bit easier for people with uh, vision uh, difficulties to, to see. Uh, for the unsignalized locations, we have about 152 uh, locations that will get at the, the minimum the basic package. And, and, you know, as a basic package will get the high visibility crosswalks, which is uh, the LS style, the, the ladder and, and bars. Um, We'll get double posted pedestrian crossing signs, which just means that uh, they post the sign on both sides of the pole. So when you're driving up to a crosswalk, you'll see a sign on both sides of the road pointed in each direction. Uh, then you'll get an advanced pedestrian crossing sign. Um, you'll get reflective sign posts. You've perhaps seen these around a little bit. Um, and then you'll also get yield here to pedestrian lines and signs. Uh, we've selected 15 locations for uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons. Those are at very uh, high use uh, uh, crossings where you can press a button and it, uh, it turns on some yellow blinking lights and it, uh, they greatly increase compliance with, with stopping for pedestrians. Um, and then we've got uh, six curb bump outs uh, to reduce crossing distances and seven tabled crosswalks planned uh, at this point in this, in this project. The uh, Pont de Rennes Bridge is uh, currently undergoing or will undergo a uh, study here uh, for repairs. Uh, they're anticipating deck repairs. Uh, it'll still carry a shared use bike path and pedestrian walkway. That's, that's not going to change. Uh, it'll just be shoring up the structure and the, the surface there to, to uh, uh, keep it lasting for a long time. Uh, Priority Bicycle Boulevards is uh, another project that, uh, that I've been involved in. We've got 20 centerline miles of uh, bike boulevards that uh, we're going to try to implement. Uh, we've hired uh, T.Y. Lynn and Highland Planning to, to basically run this project. Uh, and uh, Highland Planning is, is going to be doing some uh, significant uh, outreach in the, the coming weeks to, to look for feedback on types of uh, road treatments and elements that, that people that live along the routes as well as people that wish to bike along the routes uh, will be looking for. Um, we, uh, we do have most of the traffic calming elements, you know, that we, we will consider, you know, little roundabouts like you can see at Pershing and Rocket uh, could be considered speed humps, uh, curb bump outs, uh, tabled crosswalks, uh, you know, those, those sorts of things. Um, all in support of those uh, four main project goals that we have there for these, these routes, which will be to reduce speeds, reduce uh, vehicle volumes, increase safety at the intersections, and, and reduce the stopping and slowing for the cyclists themselves. So usually with that, what that means is we'll, we'll try to eliminate stop signs for uh, people on those routes and put the stop signs uh, on, on the cross routes uh, as, as much as, as we can uh, do so safely. Uh, this, uh, these 20 miles, we, we do have, uh, although there will be wayfinding signage also implemented throughout these corridors. Um, we do have a fairly small budget compared to uh, the cost of doing a lot of these treatments. So uh, it, uh, it'll be interesting to see what we end up with. But uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, seeing this project uh, come to life over the next few months. So uh, keep your eyes out for uh, various uh, consultation opportunities and all. Certainly share them with Reconnect and Recap. We'll hopefully uh, send them out through their, their, uh, their distribution lists. So you should be able to hear uh, that way. Uh, the Rock City Skate Park, uh, I did get word that the trail through the site should be reopened by the, the fall. And they've basically just been keeping it closed to try to reduce people coming in there and, uh, and doing anything while the concrete is curing at this point. So I, I believe the project's coming along nicely and uh, hopefully we'll be able to get back on that trail this, this fall. Uh, the running track bridge, uh, they are, uh, I believe they've awarded a contract to, to shore up uh, uh, this bridge. Uh, basically at this point, it's just uh, working on the support system. Uh, with the future goal of converting this into a, an actual pedestrian cyclist bridge and connecting it through to the Conkey uh, or the um, El Camino Trail. 
Uh, Sager Drive is, uh, uh, is parallel to East Avenue, uh, just behind uh, uh, Full Moon Bikes there. Um, it's, it's currently a sort of semi-paved, uh, half dirt parking lot and they're just making it a more official parking lot there, but they are adding a sidewalk across the uh, northern part of the, uh, the site there. So I figured I'd include that as one of the project updates here. Uh, all the parking, it will be a one-way street going from uh, Culver to East Boulevard and, uh, you know, it'll be back in angle parking, uh, which people are uh, somewhat bad at complying with in the city. So I'll be uh, excited to see how well that goes. Um, uh, we've got South Avenue and Elmwood is uh, another project that they, uh, they are just kicking off work on. I believe a public meeting will be coming up here in the next uh, month or two to, to start this process off. Um, but they'll be uh, doing, uh, I don't know if they've decided yet if it's a full scale reconstruction or if it's just a, an MNR on South Avenue, but they'll be at that point uh, adding bike lanes all the way from Bellevue Drive, which is the entrance there to Highland Hospital, all the way down to Elmwood. Uh, and then on Elmwood, they'll be continuing the cycle track on the south side there, all the way from where it uh, currently ends at Mount Hope, all the way down to the Brighton, or what, uh, the Highland Crossing Trail in, uh, in Brighton. Uh, so uh, I, I would encourage everybody to, to get out and, and uh, participate in those public meetings if you get a chance. Uh, St. Bernard's Trail uh, goes behind uh, the St. Bernard's Seminary up there. It's, this is the best map I, I could uh, find of the project. Um, they are planning to, to close it down soon here for, for safety issues uh, and, uh, and hopefully repair it in uh, the next little while, but it, it'll be basically repaired for, for better accessibility and, uh, and uh, you know, upgrading some of the treatments along the trail too to make it a little more usable for people on bikes as well. Uh, State Street is a major reconstruction that'll uh, just uh, uh, kicking off, or they've, they've just in the preliminary design phase at this point. Um, project manager told me that they'll, they'll look to comply with the City of Rochester Complete Streets policy. Uh, but uh, it is a fairly constrained space with lots of competing needs, so I, I'm not actually sure what we can expect uh, at this point, but I would encourage you to, to get involved in that project as well uh, when it goes to public meetings. Uh, so we got Upper Falls Boulevard and St. Paul Street. Uh, you've probably ridden on St. Paul Street. They, they did paint some temporary bike lanes uh, last year before they resurfaced, uh, and then new bike lanes should be out there now, I believe. Um, that uh, sort of completes uh, that from St. Paul Street all the way into uh, downtown on the other side of the, uh, the uh, Interloop North. So Waring Road, uh, they're going to be uh, putting bike lanes down all the way from Culver all the way up to uh, Norton uh, and adding a few curb bump outs and of course repairing all the uh, various curb ramps that don't meet ADA accessibility at this point. And the uh, West River Wall is another major project that's uh, just kicking off. And this is going to be a full-scale reconstruction of parts of that retaining wall that are crumbling, uh, including uh, completely taking away the, uh, the wall and, and giving you level access to the river with, uh, from the trail there. So you'll be able to uh, get right down to the water surface, uh, which I, I think will be a, a great improvement to this area. Uh, as part of this project, they're going to make a tabled intersection there at Exchange Boulevard and Fitzhugh Place, which is right in the middle of the project uh, boundaries, right where my, my cursor is there. Um, and then uh, they're also putting in a, a new waterfront plaza there across from that, uh, that table crosswalk. So that should make uh, crossing Exchange Boulevard uh, a bit more pleasant uh, and safer. And that is uh, all I have at this point. So I'll... I uh, turn it over to Jesse to uh, read off questions and I'll see what I can answer. All right. Um, thanks, Darren. Um, if anybody is interested in that uh, PDF and they get in touch with me, is it okay for me to distribute? Yep. Okay. Uh, so first off, um, people are really excited about the inner loop north. Uh, there's a lot of excitement in the chat on that. Um, also, kudos for the painted bike lanes on Monroe. Uh, thanks for repainting bike lane stripes on Dewey Avenue. So there's a lot of that ongoing maintenance things that the, the bike community uh, likes to see. So we want to make sure that you get thanked 
uh, for those. But um, before we dive into any questions, it, can you spend just a little bit of time on talking about the larger picture? I mean, some people might not be familiar with the bike master plan and what the overall vision is for uh, in terms of networks. Can you talk about that for a, a minute? Well, generally with the, uh, the master plan, uh, the bike master plan is looking for is to, to add uh, cycle facilities where we can on all the major routes through the city. So all the um, arterial and uh, collector roads. Um, you know, and, and of course there's always constraints with where we can put those down, but the, uh, whenever we resurface a street or when we reconstruct streets, we, we do look to try to add bike lanes or bike facilities of some sort in there. Um, the, the bike boulevard project is, is sort of a complement to the bike master plan in that uh, a lot of people will never be comfortable with, with biking on Main Street in an unprotected bike lane, for instance. And, and uh, hopefully the, the bike boulevards will give uh, people an alternative uh, to a lot of those routes. So we do have a full 50 miles of bicycle boulevards laid out in the bicycle boulevard master plan and we've got about five miles down right now so this this uh this project that we're on right now will uh, basically get us halfway uh finished with our uh our total bike boulevard network so we do have a significant number of more bike boulevards to implement uh, so the, uh, unfortunately I don't have a very good updated map. I actually don't have any updated map of all the various projects that are ongoing. Um, but that's something I hope to get produced, uh, at some point and provide to Jesse that he can, he can pass out or, uh, plot out a giant one to, to pin on the office wall. Um, but, uh, when, when you do see the, the full intent of, uh, where we already have bike facilities as well as where we intend to put them, you can see that it is a, a fairly, uh, good connected grid um the, the only issue sort of as i see it is that it's you know in many cases we're putting down bike lanes uh instead of protective facilities just due to space and, and cost constraints and and that's of course not necessarily going to attract uh, a significant number of cyclists that aren't already uh, out there cycling so you know, it's, it is a sort of a baby step process, uh, you know, as, as we put out bike facilities and more people use them, uh, you know, the, the politicians in charge and, and, and people will, will see that this is a sound investment and, and hopefully we can improve those as we go on over the years. Um, Darren, I remember last year at the, uh, the Active Transportation Summit, you uh, took several of us on a, on a bike tour of downtown showing us different infrastructure and it was just so interesting for you to stop at different points along the way talking about um, why, you know, the, the bike community won certain, uh, you know, protected bike lanes here, but not here. Can you just talk a little bit about how important um, citizen engagement is and showing up to, to meetings um, and that kind of thing on, and how that affects the, the end result? Sure. Um... You know, I'm, I'm sure everybody's heard the phrase, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. And, you know, that's, that's not always going to be the case, but, but certainly showing up and, and making a, a sound argument in, in your favor uh, does, it, it makes my job easier in a way. Is, is it's, uh, you know, there's, there's only so much uh, staff internally can do. Um, you know, we're, we're not allowed to lobby politicians or, or you know, uh, go above, you know, our, our senior leadership at the city, but uh, you, you as public citizens are, you know, more than welcome to, to insert yourself in any public process and, and demand or, you know, to be heard and, and, and to expect that, uh, that you'll get, uh, you know, a reasonable explanation from, from the city staff as to, you know, why they, why they can't uh, do what you're looking for them to do or, or why they can't. And, uh, you know, in many cases where the space is available and, and where uh, you know there's not a, a number of competing demands, it's it's not impossible to get you know really good protected bike infrastructure in place. And and oftentimes, uh, you know, at least with the last uh, presidential administration, there was an incentive to add uh, certain types of bicycle facilities to your to your projects to get the federal funding. So that that sort of explains Union Street to a certain extent. So, um, you know, adding that bike uh, facility in uh, made the project more viable from the eyes of the feds. Um, you know, so, so maybe in the next presidential uh, administration, we'll see the same thing. 
Um, but you know, uh, there's uh, there's there's easy wins and there's hard wins, and and there's there's easy losses and and there's there's hard losses, and you know that's that's unfortunately part and parcel. But uh, certainly, uh, getting uh, as many people out to these these public meetings or public engagement events, uh, you know, since we're not really doing meetings right now, uh, you know, showing up on the Zoom calls or you know, speaking to council and that sort of thing, uh, you know, certainly helps people understand that there is a demand for for a lot of these uh, types of infrastructure. And, you know, as, as I was told by uh, uh, Paul at Dream Bikes is, is, you know, like like bike stores across the country are running out of cycles to sell because everybody wants a bicycle now during this COVID. And, you know, if, if we can capitalize on uh, you know, people really wanting to get out and bicycling. Um, you know, we can we can really uh, change the face of Rochester in in a way to to better reflect uh, you know the, the latent demand for cycling that that exists here. So, Darren, every I can't remember if it's every three years or every four years, the League of American Bicyclists, which is the the national organization for cyclists of all sorts, they go in. Well, they don't actually go into a city but they have a process where they uh, assess a city's bike friendliness. And for two uh, assessments in a row, uh, Rochester has been awarded a bronze level status. What is it, what is most key for going up, uh, leveling up to, to silver? Oh, that's, that's actually not a question I'd be very good at answering at this point. I, I know that we have to fill out that application again this year. Um, and I, I don't think at this point we've we've done quite enough to get to silver. I think what they were looking for was uh, certainly you know more advocacy uh, types of events, uh, more bike rides, uh, uh, things like that. They're also looking for as well as as more uh, effort from cities to, to improve the the built uh, environment. Um, but uh, you know certainly we'll we'll reach out to reconnect to help us with that application. And, uh, and anyone else uh, that wants to get involved in helping us fill that out. And, and then, you know, being able, if you can look at the application then, and usually when you, when you fill that out, they'll send you back a list of why you got whatever reward it was you would, and, and it'll give you a, a very specific uh, set of instructions for how to get to the next level. So we'll be able to, to take that and, uh, and this will be another opportunity for, for people who are, are bike advocates to get out there and, and speak in favor of implementing whatever those projects are that they, uh, they recommend. All right, so Darren, we got a couple uh, questions about maintenance, um, you know, sweeping uh, debris from bike lanes. Can you explain the regular sweeping process and how often those things go through in our bike lanes prioritize to get swept in comparison to just roads in general? Can you talk about bike lane maintenance? Uh, I probably wouldn't be able to answer a lot of those questions. Uh, in, in general, uh, bike lanes aren't prioritized over any given road. Um, usually uh, the higher volume roads are prioritized over the lower volume roads, which means if bike lanes on St. Paul Street, it's more likely to get clean than if it was on a, uh, you know, uh, local street of some sort. Um, you know, uh, the, for the cycle track itself, that takes specialized equipment. So I'm not actually sure what their maintenance schedule on that one is. Uh, but for all the bike lanes that are on the roads, it's it's basically at the, the same rate that the street itself gets cleaned. So they, they generally clean the bike lanes when they're uh, sweeping the streets. Um, you know, and, it, and the same goes for, for winter maintenance. It's, you know, much the same as uh, the higher uh, volume streets get the attention first, uh, the collectors and the arterials, and if they have bike lanes on them, those are, those are more likely to get cleared, uh, unless they're being used for snow storage, which is often the case too. Uh, Darren, can you explain the rationale for leaving Broadway one way uh, between Migs and, and Goodman? Uh, well, yes, and confusion um, for drivers. Right, so that's that's uh, basically due to the on ramp there at Goodman. Is that it? Uh, from what I heard, is they couldn't uh, safely make that a two way and still have an on ramp there. So uh, because those roads are controlled to some extent by the federal government and the state DOT, uh, I believe that's why they couldn't uh, they couldn't easily convert it to two way. Um, I think we still have a possibility in the project of. of 
completing a two-way cycle track that might connect through to Goodman, but uh, that'll that'll have to be hashed out in the uh, the design phase. Because I'm, I'm not actually sure it was mentioned in passing, but I don't know if there's enough actual property there for them to to maintain that. Um, we had a question come in about policy in place for speed humps. If, if a speed hump um, is falling apart and somebody calls three one one and and nothing happens. Um, what do they do? Email you? <laughs> you can, uh, certainly email me. I, I would pass it along to our, our construction crews that, that oversee that. Um, we, we don't have a significant uh, budget to do a lot of repairs on these, these speed humps, um, but, but we are aware of a number that are, that are reaching the end of their, their lifespan and, and do need uh, fixing. Uh, on the upside, uh, you know, a, a crumbling speed hump forces cars to go even slower over it. So it sort of provides us a service there for a little bit. But, uh, but we do have uh, crews that went out this winter and I believe measured all the speed humps to make sure uh, that they still met the standards and, and they were supposed to put in a database all the ones that needed to be uh, fixed. So I, with the whole COVID thing, I'm not sure if they ever finished that or not, but uh, I'll, I'll certainly check into that. I have been asked before, um, would the city ever consider having like little cuts through those speed humps for bicycle tires? Um, you know, you understandably want to slow down car traffic, but you don't want to throw someone off their, their bicycles. So is, is, that a, is that a feasible option? It is, and I, I believe it's been done in one place in the city. I, I know someone had mentioned it to me the other day, and I, I can't remember right now. Um, but. Uh, you know, we, we've also looked at doing, and they're called speed cushions uh, uh, when you talk about ones with, with gaps through them. And, and basically the, the gap is wide enough that a fire truck can drive over it without having to hit a speed hump. But uh, narrower track vehicles like any car or truck uh, would, would have to run basically over the speed hump. Um, and that's, that'll, that'll be certainly a possibility that we'll look at on, on some of the, uh, the bike boulevard uh, treatments. Uh, generally, we don't do those uh, simply because they do cost a bit more, and then there's also more uh, possibilities for, for degradation of the road um, when you, you make more cuts like that. Uh, so they're, you know, they don't last quite as long and they cost more. Um, and, and usually what we try to do is leave a gap on the side of the, the road. I know, I know a lot of the speed humps that I at least go around, there's really not a whole lot of room for a cyclist. but. Uh, the bike boulevard project uh, uh, we'll we'll look at that and, and hopefully give it a little bit of extra space if we do uh, implement uh, speed humps um, returning to the idea of winter maintenance I mean the the 2034 plan does open the door I mean it says that strides do need to be made in the direction of, of some uh, prioritized bike infrastructure maintenance during the winter is there any talk about what uh, you know, what those priorities could be for cyclists during the winter? Uh, no, and, and you know, in, in many cases, uh, that's what we're looking for feedback on. I know uh, Mitch Gruber is, is planning to convene a, a small uh, a group of bicycle advocates to, to talk about winter maintenance plans and, and what sort of priorities to put in place like that. So, you know, I, I would encourage you, I believe, Jesse, you're going to, to be a part of that committee. Yes. Yeah. So, so I would encourage everybody to to forward your ideas and and wishes and hopes uh, on to Jesse, and and he can work with uh, Mitch Gruber on on putting together a, a winter maintenance plan. So many of us are, uh, you know, uh, gazing upon our our sister city Montreal with a lot of affection with what they've been able to do with their bike lanes in the winter and using sweep and brine as opposed to salt and uh, plowing has. Any brine or sweeping ever been practiced in the city of Rochester? How close are we to at least experimenting with it? Yeah, so first off, I'll comment on the thought that Montreal is a sister city to us in any way. But, uh, <laughs> I'll let that one go. Um, I know our, our operations department has considered other types of treatments uh, for uh, instead of salt uh, to put down in, on not just bike lanes, but, but on, on roadways as well. And, and they haven't found uh, you know, a cost efficient alternative to salt yet. And it's, it's mostly, you know, from what, what I remember, it was a lot of it was due just to the, uh, 
you know, we've got a lot of salt manufacturing facilities here, but not enough brine and, you know, all the other alternatives are a little bit harder to source. And then you also need different equipment to, to, to lay it down. And then uh, it's, it's sometimes not as effective. Uh, you know, then there's also various storm drainage issues where, where some of the storm drains don't uh, connect to the, uh, the water treatment facilities and things like that. So I, I know it's been considered and it's, it's been uh, shuffled aside for the time being. Um, you know, I, I'm sure as, as new uh, treatments come out, it's, it's worth, you know, bringing it to the attention of, of you know, send it to me if you wish or, or to uh, 311 or whatever uh, to get the, the word to the city that, hey, have you, have you thought of this? Um, you know, regarding uh, using uh, different clearing equipment for, for bike lanes and, and sidewalks as well, um, you know, I know it's, it's, it has been discussed and, and we have, uh, we have uh, worked uh, a bit with the operations department to look at some various types of equipment, but, but at this point, uh, it's a fairly significant investment to, to make changes like that. And, you know, now with the, the whole COVID thing uh, wreaking havoc on the city finances, I, I imagine that that won't be addressed anytime in the next year or two. Uh we had a question come in about bus seating along uh, particularly busy bus routes. Can you comment on, on that at all? Uh, like the bus queue project that uh, you've been working on, that the Reconnect's been working on, or just bus seating in general? Bus seating in general. Okay. Uh, I, you know, I, I can't really. Um, I, I know there's, there's no real, uh, you know, the RTS itself, I, I don't think provides uh, facilities uh, for the most part, and, and the city provides some. Uh, we do have a grant, uh, I believe, where we can look at adding some, some benches and facilities uh, across the city. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if that grant's still, still valid for this. Uh, it was originally for uh, car share, bike share stations, um, and then that might not be able to go forward with the, with the funding, so uh, we'll have to look to reallocate that. Um, but, but in general, the, the city doesn't uh, have a, a specific program to provide uh, bus stop benches. You know, as, as projects get built, uh, you know, oftentimes they'll do streetscape uh, improvements uh, at bus stops and things like that. But it's, it's, it's usually uh, piecemeal as parts of bigger projects. Uh, Darren, we had a question come in about, um, there seem to be sometimes pretty big pockets of the city that don't get much bike infrastructure at all. Uh, somebody mentioned the 14621 neighborhood, Mayor Heights, 19th Ward. Uh, somebody else mentioned that Elmwood west of the river just got repaved and it looks beautiful, but there's no bike lanes. Um, can, you, can you just explain, you know, why there are some pockets of the city that just don't have uh, better bike infrastructure? Sure, you know, and, and often it just comes back down to space constraints. Uh, you know, I live in the 19th Ward. Um, you know, none of the, the streets that, uh, you know, Genesee, Arnett, uh, Brooks, and, and Thurston uh, really don't have the space for, for bike facilities uh, uh, without eliminating parking. And because of uh, the various businesses and stuff and, and apartment buildings along those streets, uh, getting rid of parking uh, is, is a non-starter for for um, a lot of the residents. Um, you know, I, I can't speak to specific instances in various neighborhoods why they did or didn't get uh, bike uh, facilities, but, but it usually does come back down to, to how much space is available and, and what are the competing demands. And, and when I say competing demands, it's usually on-street parking. You know, if there's high demand for on-street parking, that uh, that often uh, wins out simply because uh, it's the local residents that want those. And the, the city often defers to, to the local residents on, on streets that impact them directly. Um, you know, as, as well as, as listening to the business community uh, generally wants parking to, to maintain their business viability. Um, as for the Elmwood section uh, west of the river, uh, it was discussed to, to try to fit bike lanes in there, but uh, Unfortunately, they, they needed all the, the space on that street uh, to help mitigate the congestion impacts for uh, shift change at the hospital and that sort of thing. So the thought was because there is the, the Genesee River Trail basically parallels that uh, just along the river. 
but uh, gets you more or less from one end to the other. They, they felt that was a sufficient alternative for, for that area. Uh, somebody is chiming in that, you know, it, it does seem to be lower income areas where um, we, sh we should see bike lanes prioritized. Um, and of course, you know, if, if there's not sufficient space, bikes are an efficient use of space, whereas single occupancy car trips are not. So, um, you know, how, how do we change that conversation with the city? Right. You know, and I, I think you need to be very careful uh, speaking on behalf of a lot of these uh, lower income neighborhoods, because, you know, when we do go out to these neighborhoods, they're really, you know, some of them do have demand for bike lanes, but a lot of them really don't. Um, you know, even though the, the people biking, uh, you know, in this city often skew uh, poor, um, you know, it, it seems logical that, that they might want these lanes, but they don't always. And, and the city really does try to listen to, uh, for the most part, to, to the local residents when they're doing street projects in their area. So, you know, how you change hearts and minds is, of course, uh, you know, an age old question. I, I don't have any really good answers on that, but, you know, it, it does, you know, it does involve a lot of, a lot of legwork and a lot of working with, uh, you know, advocates in, in the various different spaces and, and, you know, looking at all the intersectionality and stuff, you know, you, you do need to, to reach out to people that don't look or act like you and, and, and really ask them what they need and, and, you know, figure out how what they need fits with, you know, what, you want and you know see if there's there's a crossover there I don't know and that's it's it's just time and effort um we got a question about um you know obviously we we stick to a lot of local firms to design bike infrastructure uh could there ever be an opportunity to hire like a big name like like Copenhagen eyes or something I mean, there's always opportunities. Uh, you know, generally, what uh, keeps firms like that away, and and we did actually when we when we did our our Interloop North project, we did send letters to firms like that to see if there would be interest, and you know, and that was a, a million dollar contract. Uh, so we figured, you know, maybe there'd be some opportunity there, but uh, you know, there there really wasn't because generally the city uh, has to uh, hire. Uh, a certain amount of uh, MBE and WBE firms, uh, women and minority owned business uh, enterprises that are, you know, as part of our, there's, there's actual bylaws, uh, you know, requiring or, or uh, having a goal of 30% of that. And those, those bigger firms don't generally know, uh, they're one, they're not, you know, DBEs themselves, um, you know, so they can't just come in on their own. They need to find local firms and they don't often know the local firms. And then our, our rating criteria also uh, uh, award extra points to local firms that have actual uh, headquarters here in Rochester. So it does make it harder to, to hire some of these outside firms. And, and generally our contracts aren't, you know, a million dollars. You know, so it's, it's difficult for outside firms to make money uh, by coming into a, a smaller community like Rochester. Um, we do have uh, success with some of these, you know, bigger firms, uh, you know, Alta Planning and Design did our, our bike boulevard project. Uh, you know, they do have an office down uh, in Saratoga Springs, I think. Um, as well as T.Y. Lynn, uh, you know, partners with Sam Schwartz Engineering, which has done some really uh, progressive uh, bike infrastructure uh, planning. And they're, they're also, uh, Sam Schwartz is working on our, our bike boulevard implementation project. Uh, so, so there is some opportunities, but, it, you know, for these bigger firms that, you know, can really go out and pick and choose the work they get, uh, you know, I, I just don't think we're a, a big enough market for, for them to, uh, you know, uh, come in. And, and even if they do, they, they may or may not compete based on the, the rating criteria that we have to stick by. Uh, Darren, someone has inquired about uh, opening a, a tight path along the riverway by the skate park. Uh, it's a it's a necessary link. Can you comment on that? Uh, only that they they did look at that and they rejected it. Um, you know, I, I can't really speak to that. I'm not the construction manager over there. Um, 
they did push back against that and they didn't feel like the uh, the detour which is just down south and then right on uh, highland uh, was or mount hope sorry was was uh, too too big of an ask Uh, we had a we had a question come in. Um, it, 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 does, does the city have a policy about you know time traffic lights versus you know sensing a vehicle? Uh, you know cyclists don't like the idea of coming to a stop and then realizing the light is never going to turn for them, so they have to get off their bike and walk to press the <laughs> button. Is there a trajectory of getting away from that? You know, sensing a, a vehicle here. So uh, Monroe County DOT does all the, the lights in, in the city and they've already upgraded all the, the lights that are on our proposed bicycle boulevard network. Um, I've, I've had some issues. I, I ride the Frost Bicycle Boulevard to work, uh, you know, back when I <laughs> wasn't working from home. Um, you know, and a couple of those lights had some issues with, with flipping. So I've, I've worked with uh, Monroe County on, on getting them to, to work. So. You know, if you if you are on them, you'll see the little cameras on top pointing at you, and those are generally meant for detecting cyclists. And if, if you feel like they're not working, I would encourage you to let me know uh, so that we can reach out to Monroe County and work with them um, uh, to make sure that these work. Um, generally, Monroe County does, uh, they say they time their lights. I, I, I always feel like they don't, especially when I'm in a car, but you know, the, they, they insist that they are timed to, to uh, to move traffic efficiently, uh, which which doesn't necessarily include timing it accurately for people on bicycles, um, you know. But it's it's uh, it's something they they do uh, intend to improve as as we implement more bicycle infrastructure. Um. Darren, can you talk about? Uh, it was in the news today about the. Um the building with uh, with Mercury uh, on it. And that's a very important place, obviously, for the continuation of the river trail through downtown. Can you can you talk about Rock the Riverway and about the vision to make a trail go through the city instead of going out to busy streets and what this uh, sale of the building could, could mean for the next couple of years? So I'm not really sure what building you're referring to. Say that again. Oh, with Mercury on top. Uh, what's the official oh. name of it? Somebody can chime yeah. in. Um, you know, I, I I wouldn't be the one to to speak to the uh, the, the Rock the Riverway plans. Um, aqueduct building. There we go. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, that's uh, if if you send in a written request, I'll I'll forward that over to Eric Frisch, who's uh, the project manager there. Um, you know, and and he can speak a little more eloquently about about the plans to to complete as much of a a trail along the riverfront as possible. Uh, one of the things we'll be doing with the inner loop north is also trying to create that connection uh, to the um, uh, the riverway trails. Uh, so when they they complete the the park there behind the federal building, that should uh, get us a trail all the way from the uh, the inner loop north to the uh, to Main Street. And then uh, you know I know there is uh, tentative plans to improve it all the way to the aqueduct and and, and through, uh, but I, I wouldn't be uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable <laughs> trying to describe that. Uh, somebody chimed in. If we find an intersection with non-switching traffic lights, uh, should we call 311 to have Monroe County notified for repair? Uh, oh, if you if you find like traffic lights out, like dark or uh, non-switching, like it just it won't switch. Won't switch. You can call three one one, or you can actually call the county directly. I think their number for uh, light issues is seven five three seven seven zero zero. So generally, with light issues, you can just go straight to the county. You can also call me uh, and let me know what the issues are, or you can call three one one as well. So I was, uh, this whole time I've been trying to furiously write down everybody's questions and I'm, I've come to my last one. Uh, if I missed your question up above, just type it in the chat right now um, and I'll see it after he answers this next one, which is about, uh, you know, cities all over the, the country have been making some enhanced, uh, you know, bike infrastructure opportunities during the, the pandemic as a response to 
social distancing. Um, are there any plans for that in, in Rochester? So specifically regarding like closing streets for cyclists and, and walking. And Temporary that. bike lanes like other cities have done. I mean, there's a whole slew of potential solutions. At, at this point, there's, uh, there's no plans that I've heard to, to close streets for, for biking and walking. There is plans to do um, parking and possible lane closures uh, around resident or uh, restaurants and, and other businesses so that they can uh, set up tables outside or set up business outside on the sidewalks or in the parking lanes or in some instances possibly in the road itself. Uh, so as the next phases of reopening come on board, I think that's when they'll hope to have this ready to to implement so businesses will be able to approach the city and say you know we want to use the, the on-street parking outside our business to, to put up some tables and there will there will be a streamlined permit process for that and then various business districts can say you know we really want to shut down this road to or this this block so that you know all these restaurants can can have tables that are at least six feet apart or whatever and then the city will, will look to, to work with them on that uh, so a few more uh, questions are coming in here, Darren. I have loud cars uh, going down my street. Uh, is space and width competing with parking the only criteria the city looks at for deciding between protected bike lanes and a painted bike lane? Uh, not always, no. It's, it's also, um, you know, what, uh, you know the, the cost of doing so. Uh, so if, if it's just a mill and resurface, that means we're also not going to move the curbs. Uh, and if we're not moving the curbs, then it's, it's either a reallocation of actual street space. So if we take a four lane road and make it a, a two lane road with a turning lane in the middle, then there's space on either side for painted bike lanes. Uh, you know, in the case of East Main Street, since it was a full scale reconstruction, then all those curbs are getting torn up and, and placed new, then we can, uh, you know, put the space on the outside of the curb. Uh, which is, is generally the, the preferred method uh, now at the city for uh, upcoming reconstructions is if it's possible and if we are moving curbs, then they'll generally uh, default to uh, making them cycle tracks off street rather than on street bike lanes. Um, Darren, we have a couple questions about, you know, state and federal funding, particularly during the, the COVID pandemic and if um, if federal funds are, are opened up, d does the city have a plan, uh, a wish list that we would just kind of immediately whittle away at uh, were we to get some of that funding? Uh, specific to bike projects? Uh, not necessarily. Like the, the project list I just ran through is, uh, you know, would be all the priority projects. There's also a number of, uh, you know, unfunded uh, mill and resurfaces, you know, across the city. I'm sure we've all been on a road that probably should have been resurfaced five, 10 years ago. And, uh, you know, the, the city has, has long had a, a number of unfunded uh, maintenance needs. So, you know, if there is state and federal funding that, that comes forth that, uh, that allows uh, the city to expedite a number of projects, uh, uh, you can rest assured there will be a number that are, you know, they're not necessarily shovel ready, but you can certainly get a, a design team in pretty quickly to, to do a, a mill and resurface on, on a very street. Um, during uh, the, the comprehensive access and mobility plan during that public uh, input uh, session, um, I was um, going to a lot of those meetings and putting the stickers up on the things that were most important to me and other people were, you know, putting the stickers on the priorities that were most important for them. And there was a clear consensus that uh, cyclists want an east-west trail uh, to complement the north-south riverway trail. Um, looking at the 2034 plan, uh, there is, you know, a tentative, you know, daydream, uh, you know, east-to-west trail uh, in that in that 2034 placemaking map. What's the next step to to get the ball rolling with that? Like a feasibility study. What what can we do to ultimately get an east-west trail to complement the north-south riverway trail? You know, uh, the, one of the big issues with that is, is there's no good, there's not a river, 
that, you know, basically runs east-west that you can put it along. You know, there's no corridor that already exists without roads and, and uh, buildings and stuff along it. Um, there is a rail corridor, but working with um, the rail companies is next to impossible. And, and certainly them allowing a trail along a very uh, busy rail line is, is highly unlikely. You know, so it's, it's almost a non-starter at this point. You know, it's, it's not to say it couldn't happen, um, but, but simply that CSX railways are, are one of the more difficult railways to work with in terms of, you know, uh, property uh, share and acquisition and that sort of thing. Um, you know, for a trail along uh, one of our roads, like, you know, say Main Street or whatever, then it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that, uh, you know, I, I guess, you, you know, a feasibility study wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea. Uh, we do have an upcoming project with GTC to study uh, West Main Street uh, between uh, Genesee and downtown uh, with an eye to, to adding uh, bike facilities there which would you know just be a planning project um you know so it might just be a piecemeal uh you know approach to main street over the over the years and, and certainly uh you know working with uh, advocates to to make it known to the city that you know this is a desired thing or or you know even uh you know coming up with different plans or ideas um it's it's certainly something uh you know, the, the city can uh, try to get funding for, you know, if you see grant sources that are interested in, in funding studies, let us know and, and we, can, uh, we can reach out and see if, uh, you know, uh, various firms would, would like to work with us on, on proposing how to make that happen. Um, obviously, uh, once the city starts getting sales tax uh, again and, you know, can, can purchase things, um, can we make a wish list for you know plowing and sweeping uh, equipment that we can use someday? Uh, you can certainly make all the lists you want. <laughs> I, uh, you know, those, these are operations department questions, and I, I don't I don't think I would be the right person to answer them. But uh, you can certainly send questions to me, and I'll I'll see if I can get an answer from operations for for what their future plans are and, and uh, how they would uh, work such a, an arrangement. Uh, we, we got a question in um, about bike share and, you know, is there any update that you can publicly uh, give us tonight about bike share? Sure. So uh, as, as you might know, uh, RTS has contracted with uh, Hopper, H-O-P-R, uh, to provide bike share outside of the city of Rochester. Um, Zagster uh, recently uh, let us know that they will not be returning to our market. Um, so we have uh, been scrambling to try to see if we can work with Hopper to implement bike share. Uh, you know, at this point, because of the COVID and because of all the extra uh, steps that we might have to go through, it's unlikely we'll see bike share this year. Uh, possibly in the fall, I think RTS is trying to get something, you know, as a sort of a pilot underway. Um, but uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, at this point, it's still a bit up in the air. Uh, we still need to, to figure out if we can dedicate the rest of our CMAC funding uh, to that and, and uh, what that might look like. So it's, it's uh, unfortunately no bike share, I don't think, for most of the summer. Um, we had a question about, um, this is something I don't know much about, but project maps based on ArcGIS. Uh, the city had a, a license from ESRI. Darren, have those contracts expired? Interactive project maps? There is a new, uh, I, I don't know the whole story behind that, but I know the department has uh, been trying to do ArcGIS online and implement all that and, and update the maps. So I believe in the coming uh, months or years, I, I don't really know what the timeline on that project is, but, but we are going to uh, be putting more maps online that are, that are interactive in that sense. Um, going up the chat here. Um, is there a, Zoomable interactive map that brings to that would bring together this presentation, the Bike Boulevard plan, and the Rock the Riverway plan. Um, 
as it as it relates to to biking no not at this point who could do it <laughs> if, if it's possible <laughs> it's you know there's uh, there's been a number of uh hour reductions and and staff furloughs at the city so i i couldn't even begin to say uh what the timeline on that is Uh, I think a, a couple more questions and and that'll that'll do it. Um, first off, uh, I just want to say thank you, Darren. Uh, we know that you're an ally, that you're a bike guy inside City Hall. Um, and so whatever we can do to support you, um, you know, you've done a lot of that al al already, but if you have any uh, uh, general advice for the the bike community on how we can be supportive, not only of you but of of you know the wider, uh, administration, any, any. Oops, you muted yourself at the end there. Oh, just any advice. Sorry. Yeah. You know, like I, like I said earlier, just emphasize, you know, being an advocate means putting in time and effort, um, you know, and then building coalitions, you know, is, is you need to find people that don't look like you and don't act like you to also be your allies. And, you know, especially during this time of social distancing and whatnot, that's, that's going to be harder. Um, but, you know, we're, we're a very vibrant, diverse city, uh, with a significant number of, of opinions on how things should be done. Um, you know, and being able to come to the table, having already done a lot of the work for the city makes it easier for decision makers, uh, you know, to, to see what, uh, citizens want. Uh, so, you know, the, the thing that makes my job easier is when, you know, we have uh, people that come in and, and make, uh, you know, reasonable requests and, and do so eloquently and, and have a community behind them that supports that, um, you know, and, and showing up is, is part of the battle. You've got to show up to the meetings, you've got to show up to council, you've got to, you know, you've got to show up on the bike lanes, you've got to show that these are used, that these are valued, that, uh, that people care about these and that, uh, you know, that there is demand there that uh, not everybody necessarily sees. So, so final question as a, as a follow up to that in the world that we're in right now with Zoom everything, what, what does it mean to show up during, during this time? I mean, I, I know that there's going to be Bike Boulevard Zoom meetings. Is it, is it tuning in or is something more needed during this time? You know, that's a really tough question. Um, and I, I'm not sure I even have the, a good answer for that. Uh, you know, it's, everything's going to be tougher for the next year, maybe two, maybe five. I, I don't think anybody really knows. Um, you know, making your voice heard in any way possible, I would say helps. Uh, you know, so if, if you have a, you can write letters to, you know, all your, your elected representatives, you can, you can write letters to the city engineer, uh, you know, making requests, you can, you can certainly write letters to me, but I, I generally uh, am not uh, the one in charge in any sense of the word. So, you know, you're, you're better. I'll, I'll pass your letters on to, to the people that, uh, that uh, would like to see them, I'm sure. Um, you know, so I'd, I would say, you know, it's, it's not impossible to make your voice heard without showing up to meetings. Uh, it's, it is harder sometimes, but, you know, it's... Uh, it, it, I would, I would say look to other cities and see what they're doing and, and you know, look to other advocates, especially in, uh, you know, minority communities and, and see how they're uh, pushing through change. Uh, you know, Oakland's probably got some really good examples that we can look at, um, you know, and, and, and figure out what they're doing right and, and work with them uh, to, to figure out how, how you can uh, affect the changes that, that you wish to see in the world. Well, that's a great way to, to end. So Darren, thank you. Uh, not only did you set aside the time tonight, but I know it was a lot of work uh, putting that PDF together and getting answers from other project leads. That was a lot of your time, but we're very grateful and to get this update from uh, you, hopefully on an annual basis on the things that we uh, can look forward to and the things that we can support you on. Uh, it's wonderful. So, so thank you very much. Yeah, and hopefully next year we can do this face to face. Sounds great. All right. Thank All you. All right. Everybody. Thanks, everybody. Keep in touch.